வணக்கம் நமஸ்கார் அண்ட் ஹலோ அண்ட் வெல்கம் டு ஸ்பெஷல் ஷோ ஆன் டிடி இண்டியா அண்ட் டிடி பொதிகை அண்ட் த ஷோ இஸ் ஆன் த டிசாஸ்டர் ரிஸ்க் ரிடக்ஷன் ஒன் ஆஃப் த கீ இஷ்யூஸ் விச் கன்சர்ன் த ஹியூமன் சென்ட்ரிக் குளோபலைசேஷன் அண்ட் ஹியூமன் சென்ட்ரிக் டெவலப்மெண்ட் அண்ட் த மோட்டோ ஆஃப் ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி சஸ்டெயினபிள் டெவலப்மெண்ட் தீஸ் ஆர் த கீ கீ வேர்ட்ஸ் தட் கம் அலாங் வித் டிசாஸ்டர் ரிஸ்க் ரிடக்ஷன் இன் த பாஸ்ட் டென் இயர்ஸ் we have seen a lot has changed over the management of disasters and building a resilient infrastructure i am aisha khanum and to talk more on this issue i have with me a distinguished panel uh, here uh, to my left is uh, mr kamal kishore who is a secretary Welcome. member ndma i have another distinguished uh, guest here uh, ms mami Mizutori special representative of secretary general united nations office disaster risk reduction welcome to the show welcome i have uh, with me another distinguished guest raditya jati welcome to the show raditya jati is uh, the deputy minister uh, ndma indonesia and he has been leading his country in the disaster management i have uh, with me uh, another distinguished uh, guest mr eric letwin deputy assistant Mr. administrator mitigation fema now let's uh, begin the show i am aisha your host uh, for the uh, day today thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, panel discussion let me begin with you uh, mr kamal uh, kishore uh, the fact that uh, the drr the g20 has introduced this as a new stream and it has been very significant right from the beginning in the uh, two uh, meetings that we have seen so how do you look at this uh, under india's uh, presidency how do you uh, look at this uh, creation of this stream and what significance w- uh, does it have uh, in uh, you know uh, um, managing and building a collective efforts uh, towards uh, reducing the uh, disaster risks thank you thank you very much and thank you for having us on your show uh, as you know across the world the number and intensity of disasters is increasing just this season we've seen unprecedented heat we- heat waves across the world three continents of the world uh, are badly affected we have uh, seen temperature records being broken so many cities in the northern hemisphere are in the grip of heat wave here at home uh, we've had cyclones both on east and west coast we've had unprecedented floods in delhi you know delhi flood levels broke 45 or yes. years old uh, record and this is something which is not a problem <laughs> or only of developing or developed countries we are all in it together so we have these challenges but we also have many opportunities you know with technology with means of uh, communication with new ways of forecasting and predicting events and there are many parts of the world you know there are about 170 million people that are affected by cyclone every year only a third of them have reliable access to early warning we have to change that and in that we are all together so if g20 countries come together they can not only improve disaster risk reduction efforts for themselves yeah. but for the entire world this is totally in the spirit of the motto of india's g20 presidency one earth one family one future no one is safe till everyone is safe we really have to build a global system of disaster resilience yes vasudeva kutumbakam which uh, we are uh, witnessing here in action let me bring you uh, ms uh, mami uh, ms tori um uh, you are a global leader and uh, you know you have seen uh, the world across the world we are at the midpoint of uh, sendai framework for uh, drr so how are the countries across the world pursuing the goals of uh, sendai and what are the success stories that you know you would uh, wish to uh, i mean relate to us to tell us and the success stories which would make you proud oh well, thank you asha for the question so indeed there is a global blueprint for resilience 
which is called the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, adopted in 2015 by all member states of the United Nations, and it goes until 2030, which yeah. means that this year, 2023, we are just in the midpoint. And we had a midterm review yeah. on how member states are implementing this agenda. Unfortunately, risk is way ahead of us. And that's why, as Kamal has mentioned, we are experiencing all these disasters. To give you some idea, since 2015, 80% more people are affected by disasters. And per annum, every year, $330 billion is lost in the economy. This is a lot of money, but I'm afraid it may not be the whole picture. We may be losing more. So there's a lot of awareness about the need for prevention because of climate emergency, but also because of COVID-19. However, we still need to translate this awareness into action. And in India, a program that started by the National Disaster Management Authorities has reduced the mortality from heat waves by more than 99%, almost 100% between the years 2015 and 2020. How? This is a very comprehensive program. Early warning, of course, but combined with measures for early action, detecting who are the more vulnerable people beforehand and also setting roles and responsibilities for hospitals, for authorities, so that the most vulnerable people can be um, protected early on. And it's happening in this region where we are too. And to give another example from Indonesia, it's called sustainable resilience. This is a concept which is championed by the president uh, himself of Indonesia. This is to have first a culture of prevention and then invest in technology, innovation, build resilient infrastructure and abide by the, the global norms. There are two things which are in common between India and Indonesia. These are very disaster prone countries, both yes. of them. But because of that, the highest political will from the Honorable Prime Minister of India and the President of Indonesia, they are leading the campaign and activities for prevention. Right. And this is where you have success stories. Right. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, we have something in common. Let me uh, bring in uh, Raditya Ajati. Uh, the fact that, uh, uh, as uh, Ms. Mami uh, Mizutori uh, said, that there are certain uh, common elements that India and Indonesia say, share. Uh, now, Indonesia being a vast country and highly uh, disaster prone, uh, the important aspect is the championing of the localization of uh, disaster risk reduction. Take us through this. Uh, you know, how do you um, localize uh, uh, the, the, the risk re reduction? Yeah, so uh, as Ms. Mami Misituri mentioned about that awareness or early warning to early action, and uh, we resilience is a very local issue. Right. That's why the community is very important that we, they have to be the one who will be resilient. That's why many programs have been also conducted to make themselves resilient especially as a country like Indonesia. In the past five years, we have more than 17,000 frequency of disaster that happened, and uh, the victim can be more than 6,000 people have been casualty and died. So, uh, and you can see that most of the area in the country in Indonesia as an archipelago state is very important that we have to put resiliency at every local until the lowest level, which is of the family. Government and also the local community working together to prepare themselves to have their own uh, preparedness program. Right. Thank you. Uh, Eric, uh, similar program uh, in your country also, um, uh, the community level uh, program uh, through the BRIC, B-R-I-C. So take us through this. Uh, you know, how do you um, take forward uh, the measures uh, to scale up, uh, you know, re to reduce uh, disasters, and what are the uh, initiatives? You know, these initiatives that you have taken up that can be shared across the table on a platform like G20. Yes, so uh, we have the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program. What we're trying to do in the United States, the Biden-Harris administration is behind this, is 
trying to mitigate our vulnerabilities before an event happens. Uh, I don't have the time um, to, to write a, a grant or to manage a grant or to even understand what their vulnerabilities right. are. And so we're committed to um, providing technical assistance to disadvantaged communities to help them compete for these grants. And if we don't do that, we, we know the communities that have the capability to, to write and manage grants will, will receive a lot of the money. But we're trying to drive the money into disadvantaged communities, communities that have um, a lot of vulnerability. So we've been fairly successful so far, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, getting back to you, uh, Mr. Kamal Kishore, India has made a considerable uh, progress, you know, in the past uh, few years, and we are seeing less of human tragedy, less of loss of life during the disasters, and there has been systems put in place for early warning. And what lessons do you think, you know, India has to offer uh, to other G20 countries and Many countries you know, do look at India's uh, you know, model of uh, handling the disaster uh, risk reduction. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, there is a lot we can share in terms of the lessons we have learned, uh, what has worked in India. But we also have a lot to learn from the others, things that have worked elsewhere. So that's where collaboration with uh, Madam Mami Mizutori's organization, UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, our colleagues from Indonesia, the United States, we work very closely with them and build a global pool of knowledge which is useful for us, which mm -hmm. is useful for others. In terms of what we can share uh, with the world, I would say uh, there are three things broadly that we can uh, share with the world. One is um, application or appropriate application of technology to reduce risk and to empower people. Right. So the way we have <coughs> used remote sensing technologies, uh, collaboration between National Disaster Management Authority <coughs> and the Indian Space Research Organization in improving forecast, not just the forecast of an event, but what will be the consequence of the, that event. In other words, not just knowing what is the level of a river, yeah. but also that w what that level of river will translate in terms of uh, translate into what level of inundation, what level of flooding, which areas will be flooded and so on. So I think tech using technology to make risk information understandable, actionable and usable by local people is something that we can share. The second thing that we can share is the work that we have done on integration. Okay. Integration between multiple levels. So last month, uh, we had Cyclone Biparjoy yeah. in the state of Gujarat on the western coast and we were able to achieve our target of zero mortality from right. that event. That was possible because the central government institutions, the state government institutions, the district government institutions, district authorities and local level, local self-governance institutions, right. they could work together seamlessly no, a vertical integration. So what is best done at the local level must be done at the local level. Right. What is best done at the central level must be done at the central level. And it must work like a very sort of easy, fluent, uh, very nimble, proactive system. So I think that's <coughs> system integration is something we can share. And the third, but not the least, certainly not the least, is how we have used disaster risk management processes and, and techniques to empower local level, to empower the communities and give agency in the hands of communities. You know, we talk about our success in reducing loss of life from cyclones. Uh, a, a large part of that is, uh, of course, improvement in early warning system, but we have built multi-purpose cyclone shelters uh, along the entire coastline. It is not just about the government. Government, of course, has a, has a key role to play. But the government's key role is also to empower, to make everyone an effective disaster risk manager. We have a large uh, volunteer program, the Abda Mitra program, which has, in little over one year, prepared 100,000 volunteers, right. Abda Mitras, across the country. And you see, whenever there are events happening, you see in the newspapers how they are actually working 
with the communities in reducing losses. Does that sound uh, familiar with your experiences in your country, um, Indonesia and uh, FEMA? Thank you for yeah. the question. So I think, so let me get back. Uh, the next year will be the 20 years of uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. So okay. we commemorate how we can really see and review back again how the community have been built try to build back better based on the community base. And also 2006, we have a Yogyakarta earthquake that also devastating impact. More than 5,000 people have been killed and many houses have been also damaged. So it is very important that a resiliency for every community should be sustained. That's why it is important also empowerment of the community is yeah. a very important case that we are seeing that in Indonesia. This is a like, like a community uh, commitment that they have to preserve their area from abrasion in the coastal area, and the people in the river basin they they manage the river how they deal the river as an asset, not as a, not as something that you throw garbage on it. So that's why the people uh, we have 26 restoration movement. What we call movement is that. The community is making their own movement. How they we empower also with the government. How they react with the surrounding environment itself. So how they preserve the river basin because it's not only how they react on the environment, but also when the nature comes with the intensity of high rain. They have to they have to know what to do and how to cope with the disaster <coughs> itself. Eric, uh, U.S. has made a great advance in disseminating uh, flood-related information to the community. And there's a system, you know, wherein advance warning is shared and, you know, information is given to the community. So what are your key learnings from this uh, kind of community-based uh, flood risk assessment? And how does this integrate, you know, into uh, policy making and how does it uh, also help uh, other actors for flood mitigation planning in your country? Excuse me, yes. Uh, so FEMA produces um, flood maps for the entire U United States and uh, we continually update those maps depending on risk and population movement. And we have, um, well, we'll have like lines on the map depicting the official floodplain and um, areas of higher risk. Unfortunately, I think what, what's happened is a lot of people will look at those maps and say, well, I'm not in the floodplain. I don't need to purchase insurance or I'm, I'm not at risk to flooding. And those maps were really created looking at historical data. Okay. And we know from climate change, we just saw in the United States in Vermont just a couple of weeks ago, uh, tremendous catastrophic damage. And we're seeing this happen over and over, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And so... Um, what we're trying to do is improve the maps and uh, show graduated flood risk. Uh, we like to say where it rains, it floods. And um, even though you're not in uh, the high risk floodplain, you might still be in a lower risk floodplain. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, when it hit uh, Southeast Texas, right. appropriate action versus not. And so that's a real challenge um, is to update the maps, uh, do a better job of risk communication and education about uh, what, what people can do to make their homes more resilient, including the purchase of insurance. Right. Um, Ms. Uh, Mami, uh, Ms. Tori, uh, UNDRR, under your leadership, has been advocating for better understanding of the systematic, uh, systemic risks and uh, its cascading impacts across the system. So tell us uh, uh, more about uh, you know, uh, how, uh, to, how, how does it help us you know, better understand and tackle it at all the levels. So I think a lot of people have heard the words systemic risk, yeah. cascading impact, holy crisis. But unfortunately, everyone who is tuning into this program know what it means. I'm talking yeah. about COVID-19. Absolutely. Because COVID-19, which was started by a rather tiny pathogen, it started as a public health crisis. Yes. The whole of society needs to come together. Okay. The Sendai framework that you mentioned at the beginning, it's written in there. It's the whole of society endeavor to implement the Sendai framework because risk is everybody's business. And in that, government is of course very important and it's not only the national disaster management authorities, which are yes, primarily responsible, but the whole government has to come together 
and to that you also need the private sector, you also need the civil society organizations, you need youth, and only when you can do that together we can tackle disaster risk. Just let me take a quick uh, answer to this. Has pandemic uh, you know, changed the way we look at disasters? Has it uh, you know, made uh, the planners, the policy makers realign uh, you know, the systems and how you manage the risk reduction? Would you uh, tell us? Sir? Certainly. I think uh, the pandemic has uh, brought in new insights to the whole area of uh, disaster risk reduction policy and practice. And one key aspect of that, and uh, which uh, Mami Mizutori uh, highlighted very eloquently, is this whole notion that uh, no person, no society, no community is an island unto them Absolutely. themselves. You know, what happens here is going to affect other parts of the world sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Our destinies are interconnected. So we really have to pursue the agenda of resilience, disaster resilience, in a comprehensive way. You know, she gave the example from pandemic, how pandemic's impact yes. rippled across not just the world, yes. but across multiple sectors. Right. The same happens uh, when a cyclone occurs. You know, if there's a cyclone, the uh, power goes down. When the power goes down, the telecom uh, goes down. When the telecom goes down, ATM machines stop working and the markets stop working. And when markets in one place stop working, they, they have effect in other parts of the world so as well. it pulls the economy backwards. So backward. it really requires unprecedented global cooperation, you know. Right. Eric was talking about uh, flood risk in the United States, that, you know, there are flood maps, but there are new, new types of floods happening, floods that haven't been seen before. So the past is no longer a good guide for the future. Right. So which means that our ambition in terms of cooperation really has to match the challenges we face, the challenges we are likely to face in the future. So, and that is the whole rationale for this disaster risk reduction working group of G20 members and the United Nations coming together. A quick reply from you, uh, Mami Mizutori. Uh, the fact that the economy slows down, you know, whenever there's a disaster and we're dealing with disasters. So, uh, building a finance infrastructure is also one of the uh, priorities and aspects that, that is being discussed at the G20 uh, roundtables. So, how do you see, you know, this can contribute and also the G20 countries coming together to build a strong financial infrastructure to deal with the disasters? So, Asha, you're hitting the nail right on the head because what is lacking right now in terms of disaster risk reduction is the financing right. the prevention and although we are more aware we're not putting our money into prevention and what I mean is that yes in terms of domestic budget countries need to put more money into prevention they shouldn't wait until disasters wreck them right. and put money into the response this is something that India is starting to do. This is something that Australia is starting to do. Many countries are starting to do this. But also, international cooperation. The least developed countries, the small island developing states, they really don't have the funds or the capacity to prevent better. Uh, Raditya, uh, build back better is one uh, another aspect, you know, that um, this group is also discussing. Post disasters, building a infrastructure stronger and disaster resilient. How is Indonesia uh, handling this? So, yeah, thank you. Um, now we have an innovation on how we can also fund our uh, phase before the disaster happened and also after the disaster happened. The President Degree number 71, uh, 2021, mentioning about the, what we call the pooling fund. Right. This pooling fund is actually is not based on the fiscal year or of the local government and national government, but it's accessible for local government to uh, propose their budget for preparedness and also post-disaster rehabilitation reconstruction. So we're working with the Minister of Finance now how we can really put this deliverable for the community itself, accessible, how the uh, financial issues on innovation is not only uh, hanging on what the fiscal year because uh, Indonesia is a wide range of country when they have the high risk of index of disaster, but the fiscal year is so low. 
That's why is how to fill the gap. That's why we are working with the Minister of Finance, working with the Ministry of Home Affairs, how to put the solution on innovation. And since then, hopefully that we can also f uh, actually fulfill what we really need, what is the gap on the financial issue in the Indonesia. Right. What are your views, Eric, with regard to the uh, infrastructure and the financial aspects of handling disasters in a USA? Yeah, it's uh, going back to your, your COVID question, um, I just want to, to mention, I think COVID has transformed the entire emergency management profession. Yeah. Um, we're doing things, we, we did things over the last two or three years that I didn't think we, most people thought we'd be doing, setting up COVID distribution centers and whatnot. So uh, it's really broad and I think it, it causes us to understand our responsibilities are much broader than just floods and, um, and, and winds. Um, with, with infrastructure, the real challenge I think we have in, in the United States is that we have a lot of, uh, we're talking about this at the working group, right. we, have, we have a lot of aging infrastructure, infrastructure that's been there. We're not building a lot of brand new hospitals or water or wastewater treatment plants. We're, we're upgrading them, we're expanding them. But a lot of them are built in very vulnerable areas, areas that are subject to, to climate change. And right. th th that's our challenge, is trying to find the financing at uh, the, the federal, state, and local level. Um, a lot of our infrastructure is owned by the private sector, like our, our, uh, our energy grid and railroads are owned by the private sector. So how do, we, how do we work together across all levels of government and the private sector to try to come up with the money that we need to mitigate these vulnerabilities? We know these facilities eventually are, are gonna flood or are going to be compromised during a natural hazard. So okay. that, that's our race right now. Right. Before I uh, wrap up, uh, I would like to take uh, your comments uh, on uh, the outcome, uh, you know, the possible outcome of this uh, entire uh, working group meeting and also uh, the aspect, the priorities which are immediately achievable, which, uh, you know, which you can target and achieve immediately. So the working group has set uh, five uh, priorities for itself. <laughs> One is early warning for all. The second is resilient infrastructure. The third is national financing frameworks for uh, disaster risk reduction. Fourth is on improving systems for build back better. And finally, ecosystem-based approaches for disaster risk reduction. In my view, uh, the first three are really achievable. Uh, early warning for all, particularly, there is a call from the United Nations Secretary General to achieve early warning global coverage or yeah. universal coverage <coughs> of uh, early warning systems by 2027. It's entirely within reach. I think if G20 nations come together, they put their heads together and put their resources together, work, work together to collaborate not just among themselves but also to serve the world, this is entirely achievable. Similarly, we can really transform the way we are imagining futures infrastructure. We yeah. have... Uh, the, the Prime Minister launched the Global Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, where the United Nations is a key partner. Indonesia and um, uh, United States have also been working with the coalition. Uh, and it is really now time that we transform the way we think about infrastructure of the future. Right. So these things, if we work together, these are entirely achievable in a few years. Thank you very much. That's all time uh, we have uh, for this discussion today. Thank you very much for enlightening us on this vast uh, subject. And now we know we are in the safe hands with the policy makers and the global leaders uh, sitting across the table uh, and the G20 platform uh, giving a clear direction uh, where disaster risk reduction is an a key issue uh, for um, human-centric uh, development. And also it is a comprehensive and collaborative uh, uh, growth uh, approach uh, which will lead uh, to a safer world. Thank you for watching DD Podige and DD India. Thank you very much uh, to Thank the you. panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.